go. Hello, welcome to the Ad YouTube Podcast, episode number 63, I think we're up to, where we talk about all things YouTube, album news, tour dates, blah, 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 but we're really here to just talk about the Joshua Tree, again, so if you're sick of hearing about the Joshua Tree, you might want to stop following you too, I guess, in general, because they're going to be going on about it for a little while yet. Uh, I've got with me uh, to my uh, left, according to the viewers, uh, brand new to the show, new to at you too, as far as the podcast is concerned. Jeff, except Jeff looks like he's frozen, maybe. <laughs> Jeff? Stage fright. Can we get a <laughs> doctor over to Jeff? <laughs> oh, Uh-oh. we lost Jeff. Oh, no. <laughs> there we go. Jeff, welcome I'm to the back. show. I just to make an entrance. Yeah. <laughs> you're, are you able to hear us? You're okay? I am. Okay. I Thanks. was just doing your... I just did a two-minute introduction while you were frozen, apparently, so... <laughs> I could hear you, you just couldn't see me. Uh, okay. So by way of introduction to the listeners, we ask everybody the first time on, what uh, what was the album? When did you get into U2? What was your introduction to the band? The Joshua Tree, of course. Oh, perfect. <laughs> April of 1987. And I'm so old that I recorded With or Without You off the radio onto a cassette tape. Nice. And started that way. <laughs> then into the Joshua Tree, I think War was next. And boy... Etc. Right. Did you see the tour the first go around? No, I did not see that. Zoo TV was my first tour. Nice. Okay. And to my below me, whatever that is, to my south, Colin, welcome back to the show, Colin. Hello there. And uh, I got my Joshua tree, my Joshua oh, nice. <laughs> Diet oh, Coke cute. there. For yeah. the audio listeners, got a Joshua, Joshua Diet Coke, Joshua named Diet yep. Coke. Uh, very appropriate. Shouldn't have stolen that from the bear. <laughs> Bonus points. And Tasula, welcome back to the show. Diagonally to Thank the left you. or right, whatever way. Some way I'll get this it's straight. It's fine. We're catty cornered <laughs> from each other. How yeah. about that? <laughs> uh, so yeah, we're going to do part three. Uh, I sort of joked that if there was enough demand and or people forcing me to, we'd keep going on the Joshua Tree. So these three folks, fine folks, said they all want to chat Joshua Tree some more and we're happy to do it, obviously. Still going on, and it just ended. Their their North American leg one, I guess, ended, and uh, so we'll be doing more of Joshua Tree discussion around the at YouTube roundtable in a moment. But uh, first, just some miscellaneous stuff, as well as uh, ask at YouTube inbox questions and comments and suggestions. Um, first of all, the big day today. If you're a Zuropa fan, it's Zuropa's birthday today, correct? If I'm reading the notes correctly. Twenty four years old. 24. So do we get a 25th anniversary edition next year or 30? I guess. We'll oh, I hope so. <laughs> it would be great, but they've never yeah. been particularly, um, they've never paid a lot of attention to that album. So no, they <laughs> just kind of threw it on as an extra with the Octung baby box set. So that's probably as good as we're going to get for right. that. <laughs> and Jeff, you have a special affinity for this album, right? You got to. You yes. Got to um, I was in summer school. Well, I wasn't really in summer school, but um, I was the editor of one of the editions of the summer paper, and we only put out one per summer session. And so I happened to be running the paper uh, in July of 1993 at Clemson, and the entertainment editor was not there, but I was. So I got Zeropa, mm, I think, three or four days early and got to uh, tear into it. So yeah, what, did you give it uh, how many stars or what was the rating system you used back then? <laughs> if only I still had a copy of the review somewhere, but I don't. So <laughs> I can't remember exactly, but I do remember as much as Octane Baby surprised me and how different it sounded, Zeropa surprised me just as much from Octane Baby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, It was. it's still one of my favorite albums, I think, of just as a collection of music, but we'll save that. I for... think it is my favorite album. Yeah. Of theirs, yeah. Were you on the Zeropa discussion, or I forget who was on? No, I wasn't uh, with you with that you two okay. yet. But uh, if we're gonna do a 25th anniversary <laughs> show next year, I'm so on board for that because okay. yeah, I never get tired of listening to that album. It's 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 just amazing. So yeah, yeah. happy awesome. birthday, Zeropa. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I noticed everybody was tweeting out some lyrics uh, hashtag yeah. Zeropa today. So. You can go check those out if you're looking for some lyric inspiration today. And uh, 
I don't know, Adam, some sort of segue there from, from Zeropa to Adam Clayton, but uh, other than he's very prominent on Zeropa, uh, in, in, interestingly enough. But he's not uh, prominent on Hot King Baby. No, definitely not. But uh, recently he had the Music Cares Award, which uh, if you're not aware of, uh, I'll link to the article and, and discussion uh, on at you too in the show notes, which if you're not aware of what show notes are, you can find those at goodstuff.fm slash ATU2 slash 63 or your little iPod or iPhone or whatever player, podcast player might have the notes or the links right in the little uh, player there for you. But uh, Jeff, you were mentioning that there's the Pink Adam Girls, which uh, is a whole thing in and of itself in within the U2 fandom. Maybe for anybody who's not aware of, I guess, what is that and then what happened with them? And Well, there's um, a fan out of L.A. who... Uh, I think is an artist by trade and Art teacher, started I is that oh is she a teacher okay see I'm yeah and it was for sure. a, it was for a student project ah okay so there's the how it started and um, those stickers have gone pretty much worldwide I think they keep maps up on on her uh, Twitter feed sometimes and there is a uh, a link that we can put in the show notes uh, of them throwing a sweatshirt with a big pink atom right in the middle, up on stage. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it's a link to the twit, the vid, video on her Twitter feed. Um, and uh, yes. you can check that out. <laughs> and Which I've is... heard, I mean, just to be fair, I've heard like six different ways that it got started. So I think <laughs> there was the idea, Jeff had the idea to have the actual girls on the show to tell the story. Which yeah, we'll try and may happen in a future. Maybe. Would be great. Maybe in a few weeks. Just to clear it up because there was a lot of confusion in Cleveland. People were asking us and everybody's giving different answers and stuff. So <laughs> just to keep there we go. We'll dig to the bottom of that in this investigative reporting yeah. podcast that we do. <laughs> we're all about authenticity and facts. Not, not that fake news here. Speaking of which, uh, <laughs> so you can send in questions and comments to the podcast, uh, using Twitter. Uh, I keep forgetting. I'm sorry for the, for the, uh, the forum at YouTube forum folks, I keep forgetting to go back and check. I've been very uh, negligent in, in paying attention to you folks, but we will try to get back on that gravy, gravy train. <laughs> no. Crazy train. Um, at, at Adam's kimono on Twitter said, uh, I have a question. Do you wear a kimono while recording your podcast? <laughs> and, uh, I don't, I can't speak for all the guests ever. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I don't think anybody's ever had a kimono. doesn't look like anybody's idea, wearing a kimono. Though. Yeah. It's yeah. probably a comfortable way to record. When we have another Adam themed show, everybody should wear one. Yeah, definitely. Excellent idea. We've been working on Matt to get some at you two kimonos, but so far I haven't I haven't <laughs> checked my mail today. I don't know if it came today, but Look at <laughs> the I'll go I'll go a step store. further and wear the kimono and the little uh, face mask from Pop Mart. <laughs> there just, you go. just go all out on Adam. <laughs> uh, not a, a camouflage kimono. I'll even right. go even further than that. There. <laughs> go yeah. all in. The little zoo TV. Yeah. <laughs> The uh, at Watchmoon two eighty nine asked uh, Sandin, does anyone know what this clear box is on stage in front of Edge? With a link to, we'll put a, a link to the the photo. But it looks to me, I don't know if you guys have a different idea, but I think it's a cover around his either his effects pedals or his or else a shot of Larry's little drum kit or something in the foreground. But I think it's his effects pedals just being covered by something for the rain, is what my guess is. Do y'all? That you would any make idea. sense. Yeah. No idea. Yeah. Don't and it know looks, either. Looks like something futuristic -y or whatever that maybe was on one, one stop that nobody else got, but I think that's what's going on there. It looked illuminated, which would make sense if it's pedal stuff. Yeah, you know, yeah. That's lit up naturally. And there's probably more, yeah, more money in those pedals than my house right now. <laughs> than so. all of us put together <laughs> making a year. Yeah. Yeah. So worth worth covering up if there's a couple drops of rain coming down. Um, at Steve Doza, no Steve, not Steza Doza. Is Lord Adam Clayton of YouTube Shire not only the nicest member of YouTube, but the nicest person in the world? Um, I've never met him, so I can't say for sure, but I, I think that seems he seems to be. Any uh, further comments on Adam? <laughs> this isn't the Adam show. He's the he was the only, only one person. that shook my hand at our party. Audio submission. So if you want to record a question, send it in. Um, I'll put a link. It's to a Dropbox um uh, request box basically so you just upload your file upload an mp3 uh, audio file of some sort to that link and uh then you can get Good your time. audio back in welcome back on <laughs> we, <laughs> we're having some fun tonight with the audio uh, or the streaming and stuff um so we have some listener uh listener audio from i'm gonna say sahil but i don't know if that's pronounced correctly so forgive me if i get that wrong but uh i'm gonna play a listener submitted comment 
Hey guys, what's up? Big fan of the Ed YouTube podcast. Give it up, Chris, and the rest of the crew. Uh, I have some questions for you guys. First one is about the uh, mysterious ways. Uh, I was so happy to see it come back this week. Hopefully, it was tech uh, for so long. Not really a big fan of the UV. Uh, I think the 360 version was much better. So, mysterious ways is a good decision uh, for this hit list, in my opinion, in my personal opinion. Uh, uh, do you guys think that uh, it will uh, it will be uh, on the set list for upcoming shows or not? Uh, about the Joshua Tree songs. Okay, pause there. <laughs> He's got a few questions, so we're going <laughs> to tackle them one by one. Um, Tassila, you wanted to take the Mysterious Ways question? Yeah, comment? so I've been itching to take this question. Actually, um, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of discussion on Twitter about this. People were just furious when they replaced Ultraviolet with Mysterious Ways, even though thematically it totally makes more sense. Um, Mysterious Ways is about a, a powerful spirit of a woman which is what is on the screens behind them during Ultraviolet. Ultraviolet was originally a love song, as you know, if you've read the, the books about their songs. Um, so I was kind of in, I, th I believe it was Matt that said early on, like, gosh, Ultraviolet means something a little different to me. So I don't, I like the women up on the screen, but I don't like it messed with that um, context. And I was completely with him and I'm completely with our listener in that ultraviolet was awesome on 360. I haven't felt that way about it on this tour. I've loved the women's presentation. I've shaken my fist and screamed and hollered and hooted and clapped for every single woman up on that screen every single time I've seen the show. But I actually really believe Mysterious Ways is more appropriate for it. That said, a <laughs> couple nights ago, what they did was play Mysterious Ways first. Bono got his little dance on. All the band had fun with it. Edge did his solo. They played it like they always play it. And then they went into Ultraviolet with the women's presentation. And everybody seemed pretty happy about that. Mysterious Ways got the crowd going. No, no uh, argument there. So maybe that's the way to please everyone. But yeah, if, I, if, it, if I were in charge, I would let Ultraviolet sit it out the rest of the the tour and replace with mysterious ways yeah i'm selfishly i'm glad that they played ultraviolet in vancouver at the opener and got because i've i've heard or played heard mysterious ways played live but uh i can see understanding if it was your first show or only show then you'd kind of want i'd want a little bit of both so i'm with uh saudi but doesn't 22. the context matter to you i mean or maybe maybe it's different I... for women and men and that's fair if that's if that's the case i totally get it but I think there is a little bit of a difference between men and women on that point, but I do agree with you. I think that Ultraviolet is so dark originally right. as a song, and Agreed. that's where when you add in, because Light My Way, I think that's what he's trying to say in the song, and to repurpose it. Now, they've been repurposing songs for decades. They've done it with Sunday Bloody Sunday four or five times already. Sure. So I do understand that, but I, I agree that thematically, I think Mysterious Ways is a better fit. But then you can't pull a girl up on stage and dance with her if you've got the exactly, the and that's behind. what so. I think. That's why I think they ended up playing both the other night. I think you're right. Yeah. All right. Let's okay. Let's keep moving on. His uh, if I hit the Colin. Right here. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Colin. And Colin wanted to talk about that too. I mean, he he did have thoughts that's on true. that. Uh, I don't know if you guys discussed that in the past uh, episodes, but there's some ups and downs for me. Oh. Uh, I think each and every time they go with the uh, one, uh, one tree hell, I'm sick or two uh, with heaven from Bono, of course, and a little bit of Age's solo. Uh, Red Hill Mining Town, I think that is the only song that is not better than the uh, the album version. So uh, will they ever uh, play it originally as the uh, album, uh, you know, album cover? Uh, last thing. Okay. <laughs> There's sort of two in there, I think, but the Red Hill Mining Town being played as the album version or the live version, I guess, not being as good as the album version, right? And or I have a, maybe I have it the other way around, but we sort of consensus has been. I know we've referenced this in the previous episode too that the remix version would be the ultimate version to be playing now, um, but I, I don't think they're going to change at this point. It seems like a song that live, anyways, they're not going to mess with too much they kind of just have it the way it is they don't seem to like i don't know you've seen more shows than i have i guess to sula but 
Um, do they love playing it live, or is it kind of like they're just playing it out of duty? I don't sense that they love playing it live. I mean, Bono started to make that that remark at the end of it every time. You know, we finally figured that song out. You know, right. he says it every night. Um, he, well, no, you didn't really, because <laughs> you, it doesn't sound it doesn't sound like the album, and it doesn't even sound like the new remix. It sounds like kind of a little bit of a watered down, safe version yeah. of a hybrid of the two as far as I'm concerned. And I agree with the listener. I would rather hear, well, I'd rather hear one or the other. I'd rather have him just go for it um, or play it the new way, crank the horns up, call it a day. Yeah, I think when we did the Red Hill Mine Town sort of B-side that we did or whatever, we were all kind of excited to hear it live. And then Love the new one. Yeah. In Vancouver, it kind of felt like, oh, that's it, I guess. And like Saudi, Saudi, 22 in the chat room says it needs guitar and I, that's what i said it too does after. need guitar it just that needs was what something. you said Very in badly. vancouver yeah just to have even whether it's the slide or the picking or whatever something in there just the piano too much of just edge on piano feels a little bit like you're in a lounge somewhere and not in like the biggest concert of your life potentially or whatever i guess so well and there are two other options for piano as well i mean bono might be able to play it and terry under the stage certainly could play it yeah so yeah, don't exactly. understand why Edge is not, not playing more there. I get the feeling Edge likes playing piano, but it's like... I think he does, too. <laughs> I think we were overlooking a very obvious yeah. you know, detail there. It's kind of like but when Bono say... liked playing guitar. <laughs> it's like... Well, fair enough. Um, not, but he is that a good piano not that Edge isn't skilled at playing yeah. the piano. But, but that said, um, running to standstill also could use the zoo tv version yeah i would rather hear the zoo tv version yeah big time uh okay i'm gonna play out the audio here from him uh, here i know uh it's a lot of questions but uh, i want to give it all here the innocent and experienced concert was having fans in stage uh each show i believe uh and there was a uh, guitar players uh doing it with the band from the audience uh why this year they didn't do that till now plus do you think that uh, the band will have some extra songs or special songs for some cities uh, that they used to play like Chicago they did in uh, IE concerts some special songs for them uh, that wasn't even uh, on the list so thanks thanks guys uh, sorry if I take much time and I look forward for your answers <laughs> awesome and uh, so there's sort of two questions in there one of like uh, adding why don't they bring people up on stage to play guitar with or presumably guitar anyways I guess it could be piano now <laughs> uh, with the band uh, and then why aren't they adding sort of random special songs to sort of mark each city in a different way or whatever, just random songs that aren't necessarily on the set list to have a little bit of fun. Um, and so, I don't know, do, I, I'm thinking the guitar playing side of it or bringing fans up on stage, they sort of got a little looser towards the end of the American leg, right, where they brought people up to dance, like you said, during Mysterious Ways. But it feels like they kind of want to give a performance that's locked and set. And so bringing a fan up on stage kind of opens it up to a little bit of what may be a little, I don't know, outside of the production mayhem. yeah mayhem. Well, remember the screens limit them during the actual album right. right they have a finite start and end yeah to those songs for the most part you know with the exception of something like running to stand still which is just them projected on the screen but like trip through your wires and one tree hill and all that stuff is choreographed mm -hmm. so yes yeah, during the so encore much. they could but not not in the album and that's generally where they would have brought somebody up, right? Is in sort of the middle somewhere, not like your encore. I don't know. Right. I'm sure they have right. in the past. I'm not saying it's never happened, but right. But <laughs> I in can't general, remember in they won't memory, even... though. Yeah. Go ahead, in Jeff. general, if they're not going to play snippets in the Joshua Tree songs, then I don't think we're going to see anybody up on stage, and we really aren't getting any snippets in those songs either. Yeah, and as far as I don't know, Colin, if you have anything else too, but on while well, you're here, <laughs> the the, uh, <laughs> the set list changing up or adding, you know, random throwing in a sweetest thing or something, you know, just sort of off the cuff kind of stuff. But um, again, it feels like a very overall fairly rigid production from start to finish, even outside of the Joshua Tree segment. But any thoughts on that? Oh, we don't have any audio, Colin. Oh. No, we don't yeah. have audio from him. Try now. Uh, hello. There we go. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, it just seems it's such an unusually structured show, unlike all their other shows where you have that middle section where they can play around a little bit uh, before they get to act two. 
or the encore, but this is just such a, it, it's, it is, you know, structured in a way that doesn't allow much for, for much spontaneity. And even in the encore, they got, they got to do Miss Ariova. They got to get to the ultraviolet. They got to get to vertigo because they have the graphics and everything and throwing some kind of wrench in the middle of that just doesn't, it just isn't that kind of show this time around. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think, I think what fits here well is what Tim Newfeld has said before, which was that I and E was much more like going to see a play. And this tour is much more like going to see a film and yeah, you know, a film is film. Well, it's not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. But it's not. It's it's much more static than the other stuff that they've done in the past. Which is going to make the tour video really interesting, and I'm I'm really skeptical as to how they can pull that off. Um, because I mean, I've already seen some pro shot stuff that's been edited around the show, where you're cutting to the musicians and then cutting to the screen and cutting to this and that and that, and it's such a I, I, I would hope that they hire somebody to film it in a, as static as possible with as few cuts as possible. Cause I think that's the best way to watch it. I mean, I, it's, I, I can't imagine how they're going to do that, but it won't stop me from buying it, but <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> really w- hope they take the uh, Jonathan Demme approach. Uh, stop me for stop making sense and just let the shots linger as long as possible instead of over editing it like they've done in the past. Yeah, especially when you're combining the visuals that they have on the screen with the band and all that kind of stuff. You're, yeah, as long as I mean, you two fans would buy it even if it was like shot from a seat that had a sight line obstructed by a tower or something. <laughs> we'd still all line up and buy it, and then maybe complain a little bit, but we'd still have a copy kept in the wrapper, and then when we watched. But <laughs> I digress. Um, we're kind of like say all over the map as far as we're already kind of into our roundtable. So the Joshua Tree tour discussion that we wanted to sort of have now um, as part of our roundtable discussion of just kind of we've all Jeff actually I forgot to ask you've seen the tour right? It's how many stops? Twice. Twice. I saw both okay. Chicago shows. And Colin for you? Uh, both Chicago shows and Cleveland. And Tasula, what about you? Uh, five. Um, Vancouver, Seattle, Miami. Foxborough and Cleveland. All right. So I'm going to shut up from this part because you guys have all seen at least more than once I saw Vancouver. So what uh, overall impressions that you've had after seeing multiple shows? And I guess as the solo show person here and chat room, if there's some questions you have, feel free to chime in. But um, I guess the big one that often would be like non YouTube fans. <laughs> Sorry, Colin. We'll see you again in a little while. Um, uh, would have is why would you see more than one show especially like we said it's kind of a structured locked in show um, and then sounds ha- like my wife <laughs> has uh, has it been worthwhile and, and just comments after seeing multiple shows I guess Jeff you can why don't you start seeing a couple shows well the screen was what I was most mesmerized by um, watching on Periscope so I did have an idea of what I was going in for um, but what I thought was the most interesting part of being uh, there for the screen um, is what that curved part of the screen does for you. Um, the two night I went two nights in a row, and if you were looking at the stage, I was on the back right corner in seats for the first night, Saturday night in Chicago, and then I was actually lucky enough to be in the red zone on Sunday, so front left, so pretty much opposite caddy corner uh, spaces in the stadium. And the thing that I noticed the most was during streets as the lights pop and then the screen comes down to reveal the road, no matter where you stand in the stadium or where you sit, that road looks like you're right in the middle of it because of that curved screen. And that's something that you just don't get the effect of when you're watching. I think that the technology is great. I love that I can watch shows on Periscope, but at the same time, it's still not the same as being there. Yeah. (laughs) How about you, Tazula? Any comments on the multiple um, shows? I agree with Jeff's comment. Um, when when we saw it together, Chris, we were pretty central to the screen, right? So it made yeah. sense that it felt like we were kind of going down that, that road. But when I saw it in Foxborough with my sister and nephews and Michelle and Jill, or everybody was in the, in the place that night, um, I was behind the red zone. I wasn't in the red zone, but behind it on the rail way over to the left side. And the effect was exactly as Jeff describes it. It was exactly the same. I I would have thought that I was straight ahead of it because it looked like I was going down that road. So 
pretty amazing technology. Um, as for why why see a bunch of different shows, the set list does change. Um, I heard I Will Follow in Seattle. I heard Mysterious Ways in Cleveland. Um, I heard The Little Things in Vancouver. I heard, and Cleveland, or no, and uh, not Cleveland, and Boston. I guess, I see now I'm even <laughs> confusing them all because it's all so recent. But, um, but the band also changes along the way. Like when we saw them in Canada, you know, they're just fine tuning everything. They're working the kinks out. Seattle, much more relaxed. You get Eddie Vedder on stage. You yeah. know, Miami, I'd never been in an audience that was primarily Latin American. And that was an amazing experience. I, I wanted to buy tickets to all of the Latin American shows <laughs> after Miami because I was actually in a seat. I was in a nosebleed obstructed view seat and no one around me sat down at any point in the show. Everybody was up dancing. And I've never experienced that before. I've been in seats at U2 shows before where plenty of people have been sitting down and have been angry when people like me stand up. So that was a really great experience. The vibe in Miami was just phenomenal. So yeah, there's, there's a million reasons to see them. And then of course, the personal side of it is, you know, I had my family in Massachusetts. I had you guys in Vancouver. I had my best friend in, in Cleveland, you know, so. Yeah, that's why. How about you, Colin? Uh, we were just discussing the reasons and stuff to see multiple shows and what your experience was over multiple shows. Yeah, I apologize. My internet keeps cutting out. <laughs> okay. and I don't know why tonight of all nights it does this. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, no, I've seen yeah the two Chicago shows and the Cleveland show. I feel like I've seen all three uh, versions of this tour. Um, you know, in Chicago, they uh, it was. Uh, the first show was uh, they did, you know, bad and I will follow. And then the next night they did a sort of homecoming and the little things that give you away. So there's that version. And then in Cleveland, uh, I, I thought it worked. I thought the set list worked the best, even though I'd rather hear sort of homecoming instead of bad in, the, in that part of the show. Not nothing against bad at all, but I just don't think bad works that early in the show. I think it belongs in a later part of a U2 show. Um, but uh, I thought structurally I, everything seemed to flow a little bit better. I mean, in the encore, uh, it seems like they finally worked out the kinks in the encore, and which is the best version of that. You know, starting with Miss Sarajevo and and then just cranking out a. L- oh, shoot. oh no! <laughs> there we go, guys. He's I'm sure he had something really. He was on amazing. a roll too. Yeah. <laughs> we'll come back to you, Colin, if you unfreeze. At some point, he'll all of a sudden like uh yeah drop back into the <laughs> we should talk about the closers too like that the last song because that's been a hot debate mm-hmm. among fans and i am of i've heard five different lives or no four different live songs i guess uh, four different ending songs sorry right. four, four different live songs of course <laughs> I heard four live songs i really need to take less cold meds before <laughs> podcasts but anyway um like the the debate between vertigo like some ending on something really high charge like vertigo or something quiet like one or the new song i mean what do you guys think i'm i'm in the i'm in the leave happy camp i i loved vertigo being the end in florida so that was my favorite or i will follow in seattle was great as well yeah it's hard because i i love the like just personally, I love the the little things getting that taste of it at the end as a way of like thematically saying, okay, next time we see you, this is what we'll be doing or something, you know. But I totally get that yeah. having a dead audience around you who's like, what the heck is this, and kind of checking out, isn't really a great way to end a show and leave the show. So if yeah, if you know you're going to be surrounded by hardcore fans the whole time, like you know, being there with the IU two crew is like, who cares? Because we're all like pumped that we get to hear this new song for the first time, but the bro dudes beside us who are like chugging beers the whole time and like don't could care less or whatever, obviously, and start heading for the exit or whatever. It kind of takes away from the bit of that. So whereas going out on, yeah, like I will follow or vertigo or something, the crowd's going to be pumped and excited and jumping. And so I don't know what the perfect answer is there. And I, I, yeah. well, I think it also depends to a degree. I mean, you've got essentially six to seven or eight songs that are in the encore. And they were consistently the whole, the same songs on this leg. And you have Miss Sarajevo and to a degree one, the way it's played and little things that are sort of, I guess what you could call down songs. And then you've got 
beautiful day and elevation and then adding in vertigo and mysterious ways which are up songs and ultraviolets maybe a little bit in between probably more of an up song but you know how do you structure it i think they finally got it right with miss sarajevo where it was supposed to be um coming right out of mothers but at the same time if you start slow there and then hit the crescendo then you've got to kind of come back down to earth again and so do you go slow fast slow fast or just slow fast slow or you know that's yeah. what they couldn't seem to figure out. So I'm interested to see if or they'll do you tweak cut it. Out, all is there for too much own. slow in the encore? Too much well, slow all, <laughs> all around. This kind of gets to uh, just we can answer this now because uh, at P Bear 1979, uh, if which you would have Bjorn. followed Bjorn, uh, Bjorn on the podcast, and he was infamous, famous, whatever for <laughs> periscoping the rehearsals out of Vancouver, screaming from the hotel. And uh, but his question is. Just simply dreaming out loud. Willie Williams gives you full reign for leg two. What changes do you make? And that's sort of where we're. I, in my mind, you kind of like you have to do the Joshua Tree. Continue with that structure, like the album start sure. to finish. But uh, yeah, if we're just continue riffing, I guess on the the way you end the show. And is it yeah, up down up down but, or where do you go? Well, this is an interesting topic too because I think it goes to the difference between is it are you going for the music or are you partially going for the film because i think miss sarajevo slash miss syria is a perfect example um online on periscope or if you're watching a youtube video doesn't quite translate but when you're standing in the stadium and that film envelops you and the uh the, the picture goes around the stadium. It's just, it's really, really moving. And it's something that when I'm watching at home on Periscope, I only get a certain amount of, but while I was there was just emotionally overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know which one if, I want. By the time you saw it, Bono was calling out like, hold her up, hold her up. And you knew to expect That's it. True. Right. But we right. didn't in Vancouver, if Chris hadn't poked me on the back and said, like, look over there, <laughs> I wouldn't have seen it. I wouldn't have even known it was going on because I was so mesmerized by what you were saying. The film itself was so moving and so sad. The and they also absolutely. cut down what she said. Her speech in Vancouver was like eight minutes long. Or so. right. I mean, I'm exaggerating, yeah. but it, it was much, much longer. Now she has like three sentences and then she's out. Um, oh wow! I didn't so realize I, that. I do yeah. think that it, you lose something by not being in the stadium when her face goes around, though. Yeah, yeah, and we'll see what they change. What they change as far as you know, Europe, even just being obviously closer to what they're talking about and how that might affect what they decide to do with that, or if they'll just keep going the same way. I don't know. Is there any? If you let's say maybe it's too hard to discuss in a reasonable amount of time you get full reign for a leg too, but like what's the one big change you'd like you would make if you were Willie Williams replacement for Europe and you, you get to give you, you know, one thing you can change and what would that <laughs> to make it the best show possible or whatever in your mind after seeing the shows that you did. Um, maybe anybody hmm. want to jump in on that one? We're losing. We've lost Colin time. for the night, by the way. So apologies oh. to Colin Uh-oh. fans of the world. His uh, internet seems to be dying on him. So he's, going to bow out at this time he's he'll be back another time so one thing (laughs) putting on the spot well i would take out one that's that's (laughs) if i could if i could change one thing i mean going back to the early discussions we had before we saw the tour when i think it was again it was matt it was matt or you chris i don't remember which one said like, wouldn't it be great if they came out and did Zoo Station right after the album? Like, what comes next? And then they went into Octoon Baby, you know. Right. <laughs> of course, that would be my dream come true. Yeah. But uh, they are playing two songs from Octoon Baby in the encore. So, you know, I mean, we got kind of part of our wish. But, yeah, I would take – one just brings me down. <laughs> and it's not – I have no problem with Bono preaching. I am on his side politically. It has nothing to do with that. I just am so – of that song live and i think it loses so much live well i'll I'll just to counter your one now the one fans getting mad at you i'll say oh i'm sure i'm (laughs) vilified already i'll say they should pull out pride because that's that's my song that i love it when it's live but it's it is it's just one of those songs that it's not doesn't it's lost its uh ability to have that same kind of impact i guess for me just because it's played so long so much but uh how about you jeff any um Well, one of two things I think I would do one, because there's such a narrative going through the first two acts where it's literally 
two songs for more and then two from the unforgettable fire and then straight to the Joshua tree. I mean, I really think it would make sense if they came out of the encore and although they would be greatest hits type songs, I think some stuff from rattle and hum would fit perfectly right now, there. That's a good point. Yeah. Heartland. That's the, and actually I take back everything <laughs> I said, just play Heartland. <laughs> End with Heartland, and then it's all is forgiven. You can play one four times in a row if you play Heartland. <laughs> but you could you could come out of of the the to start the encore with Desire, and then Heartland, for example. Sure. And then Sounds and lovely. then go That's to fun. go to two from Octung Baby, and finish with Beautiful Day and Vertigo, and there you go. There's a show, as they used to say on Seinfeld. I really um, honestly thought they were gonna play something from Rattle and Hump when they when they were doing like the Facebook chat before the tour started and everything, and right. they specifically brought up Heartland, I was like, oh, hallelujah, please. <laughs> and I mean, all those, the Rattle and Hum songs do really well live. Angel of Harlem and, and um, mm-hmm. Desire still do really well live. So I, I'm kind of puzzled why they're not playing them. Yeah. It seems like it'd be an easy one. Again, I'm going back to, I forget whose question it was about, you know, bringing people up on stage too. Like a Desire is the easiest guitar song as far as most guitar players to play and along to and get some up there and just strum along or whatever and stuff like that so they could certainly very easily do that but it does feel like that tour that this tour is like a in and out quickly <laughs> do the thing like do it well but keep it moving so um but speaking, the easiest thing that you can say that you should do to every u2 show ever is end with 40 <laughs> well i think that's that goes without saying like if we had our way they'd always end with 40 right any 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 diehard would probably exactly. say i certainly would agree with that um i wondered why there isn't there aren't more people holding and maybe it's because i haven't been too close to the front at all this tour but i haven't seen any i play the harmonica signs mm. i would think that'd be an easy one just the and handstand you want your guy. mouth on something that no, Bono's had his mouth on by the children by doing handstands is is <laughs> yeah. a bigger thing which i it still works. don't understand it still, we have never heard the full i don't know if it's out there somewhere the whole story from that guy maybe we should try and track him down or whatever but like, let's get him on the show <laughs> just what like, were you thinking of all that that's be, actually that podcast i think the, the, the <laughs> my, i think my most retweeted tweet was me quoting beth saying something about like i finally get on stage and what do you want to do play guitar no i want to do a handstand and that's like it just is like, <laughs> of all the things to do on stage with youtube but Whatever, I guess it all more power to him. He got to do what he wanted to do. So, uh, and for some reason, the band ended the show with that too, which is even more. Odd. And Larry even played along. Yeah, that that's what good. like Larry doing which the little seems drum. Seems like it was contrived. Yeah, like maybe a friend of the band or something. Or like, a friend of a friend or somebody's nephew or something. Yeah. yeah, but even still, anyway. Okay, we got some questions for folks. We'll try and blast through here too. Uh, at Watchman two eighty nine said, any thoughts on why band didn't go to B stage for encores in Philly? Technical issues they do usually do right. Um, I missed that one, so I don't know. None of us were in Philly, I don't think. Yeah, um, and that's one of the few I didn't watch on Brian Facebook. Brian so was in Philly. That one. Yeah, I don't know if they, I don't know if there was rain or anything that night. Weather issues, maybe that would hold them back from going out. I don't know, um, but yeah, it could have been just technical. Maybe they're having ear, in ear issues, <laughs> inner ear issues. At maybe the crowd was mean. Yeah, at the, exactly. at the, on the, in the earlier songs, who knows. <laughs> Bono didn't like the smell down there. Um, <laughs> at YouTube Runner said, just saw my first two of five shows on this tour. Do you think this is the last anniversary tour the band will do, Act on Baby, in 2021? Uh, there's money. <laughs> the money. I wish they would, but they've gotten so much grief for doing this one. I don't know that they will. But you don't think, I mean, adding more shows to the tour alone seems like an admission that it it's working. Oh, They're, it's absolutely working, but and, it's still, it doesn't mean there's not backlash. Yeah. Just because something's monetarily successful, yeah. But and Joshua well, Tree think... is a bigger album than Oct. As much as y'all may not want to admit it, um, it did better <laughs> than Octane Baby, and it still does. <laughs> it did. So, do you think part of the part of the backlash though comes from their own "We're not a nostalgia act"? Um, yeah, it comes yeah, at a glance. Yeah, it comes I mean, off hypocritical. They, they right? asked for it in that way. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, probably. So that's, I think they get, yeah, it's, it sort of plays a, at surface level anyways. It certainly feels hypocritical if you don't l- think too much deeper or even listen to the band talking about it and stuff. And and they've changed their minds on things too in the past and it, I'm sure they will again. <laughs> so <laughs> it happens with people apparently. 
That's what I hear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> at, uh, at YouTube Runner had another theory uh, sending in. This this tour was a way to remind people about YouTube and their amazing live show as a way to promote songs of, innis- of experience in the fall. Thoughts? And uh, Jeff, you wanted to sort of jump off on this yeah, one. Yeah, well, I mean, those two questions back to back give you an interesting idea. Well, what are they going to do moving forward? Do they stick with what they said before and no, we're not really a nostalgia act um, as much trouble as they've had putting songs of experience out, you know, will it be the last one? Uh, we're reaching the point and they're reaching the age where that question has to be asked. And, you know, are they enjoying this so much um, as a nostalgia act, so to speak, uh, doing the Joshua tree that they decide, yeah, after we do songs of experience, you know what, let's, let's start doing more of those. They still have songs of ascent that they've talked about too. So that's well, what Bono's yeah, talking about. There's three albums if we <laughs> trust them. Trust Bono. And Fabiano <laughs> says in the chat room, if they do an Actung Baby tour, we'll finally get to listen to Acrobat Live. <laughs> <laughs> so now I hope they don't do it just out of spite. No, I'm kidding. I would totally go. If they if they did Acting Baby, I'd be first in line. Are you kidding? That's Absolutely. Okay. I think there is a certain element. But like, you're one again, Tessua. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I know, right? I would be forced into that every night. It'd be over with quickly at the beginning. But the um, there's an element of like, uh, what's the word, credibility or whatever, because they're doing the whole album start to finish, and it's not just the greatest hits. Like, in a way, they've they've been criticized in the past for almost doing a greatest hits tour, say, No Lines uh, 360 tour in a wake or whatever, right? right? Whereas comparing them to the Stones or the Who, like I think you mentioned, Jeff, in your notes here, but... I feel like they're more of just like strictly nostalgia act at this point. And as much as they put out an occasional new album, you're going there for start me up or whatever. And, and so, and I'm sure there's a uh, stones podcast that's having an argument. No, <laughs> it's say, paint it black. That's throw it why this way under, well, it's because well, YouTube covered it. <laughs> no, <laughs> but uh, maybe subconsciously. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's my favorite stone. Song. It feels like they've, navigated away from that just by you know like springsteen doing it other sort of acts have done it doing the whole album experience as a just as an experience and that's not a cash grab even though it totally is a cash grab i guess so i don't know i don't know how you navigate well the the other thing that i don't know enough technically to say and chris since you play guitar maybe you know a little bit more about it but given all the different stuff edge does i mean how many songs realistically can they learn to be able to do (laughs) you know, have 50 to 60 songs in the repertoire to, to change the set list up that much. I don't know if that's really something they can do. Yeah. It's, I I get the impression the more I learn about how they play and stuff live that it is, they all tend to want to perform well, which I mean, that's admirable obviously. And as a result, they don't want to have to um, try to remember, play a wrong, a minor instead of a major chord or whatever is at risk screwing up even though it would give a bit of like live improvisation fun um, that fans would generally love. They seem to be on the more perfectionist side <laughs> other than maybe Bono and Adam, I don't know, um, of this, of the equation. And so don't want to make a mistake. And so, yeah, be reluctant to have too many songs that they're trying to remember on one particular set list. And like you said, they are getting older, so it's harder to remember <laughs> certain <laughs> chords maybe at that point. But um, who knows? I'd, I'd love to see an ac- acrobat um, Acrobat <laughs> sorry I love to see Acrobat but I love to see uh, Act on Baby concert uh, no question that's the album that got me into them uh, Fabiano says Pearl Jam have 200 songs rehearsed for each concert <laughs> uh, but yeah I would like to see the screens that they come up with for Acting Baby you know to, to mirror Zoo TV yeah reimagine we know that, that Morley still got it she could come out and dance again <laughs> she looks great she's yeah. dancing on this tour on the screen you know <laughs> like bring it yeah, exactly. Uh, Fabiano uh, asked, uh, in which city was the best performance of Shadow Man, the character that Bono sort of Ooh. inhabits for Exit? Ooh. I don't know how, I, we, none of us one. have seen all of them, obviously, the, so far, so it'd be hard to know. I don't know, Jeff, you've watched a lot of the Periscopes, right? You, you said? Yes. Um, do you think hmm. it varied that much, or is there a lot of... It's a pretty intense thing. I mean, my, my feeling... And actually, I think even time-wise, that end, the, th- the last three songs of the Joshua Tree exit, or One Tree Hill exit and Mothers, is probably the emotional heart of this set, this entire set, not just the Joshua Tree part. And I really see Bono doing some things like in Running to Stand Still and Red Hill, 
he does a little bit of spoken word, a little more spoken word than he's done in the past. So I think I think of him almost like an aging boxer or an aging tennis player <laughs> who realizes that he's got to save um, save his effort for the points that matter the most. And uh, I think that exit, well, One Tree Hill exit, Mother's section is where it matters the most. I think he spends expends the most amount of energy uh, of any song during the entire set during exit, and it's well worth it too. Oh, absolutely. And what um, I don't know if we've if you've mentioned it. Actually, I don't think it. I think it happened since you've taped the last show. But Vid actually had our friend Vid um, had a conversation with Morley on Instagram. And Morley hmm. choreographed exit. Oh wow! So that is very controlled, and yeah, his movements scripted. and everything—it's all scripted. It, I mean, the theater is so powerful; it doesn't surprise me. But I'm glad she asked, and I'm glad that Morley responded. <laughs> yeah. To put that to bed. Yeah, it's interesting. But I agree. Yeah. So I don't know, Tassili, You saw five shows. Is there anything that any one performance of it that stood out more than the others? As far as I know, you're in different spots, so it's hard for, to sort of. But for me, Vancouver, because it was just such a shock. I think you know, like I didn't know what to expect in Canada, and nobody knew what to expect. We had seen Bjorn's Periscope <laughs> of the outside of the <laughs> venue, so we knew that the lighting was going to be the same as Rattle and Hum. Uh, or very similar, if not exactly the same, but it's pretty close. Um, but we had no idea what Bono would be doing or what he'd look like or what Edge would be doing. I mean, if you watch Edge during that set, he gets pretty far into it as well. Yeah. Um, that's what I did in Boston. I focused completely on Edge. I tried it with the exception of a few pictures I took. Um, I focused on Edge just because I'd never paid attention to him during that song. And he's really deep down into it. My sister made a, a cool observation that the that his guitar sort of sounds like a machine gun at the end of yeah. that. And I hadn't thought about, about it that way before, mm. but I like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was it was cool just to see, I know for me, having in Vancouver, seeing this him inhabit a character again, which he hadn't really, I mean, he sort of did, I guess, the, what was that like the bubble suit or whatever and like but it, it felt somehow this felt different and like inhabiting the what a, guy what did you like do the guys? 360 or the what, what did he do with ultraviolet with the, like the sh light oh, suit he man? jumped on the steering wheel yeah but didn't he have like some sort of light jacket i don't know if that was supposed to be a character yeah, the laser just, pointer jacket. Yeah. i don't know that it was a character anyways yeah i don't i don't think so either i just was trying to remember bef since like mcfisto basically right like has there been yeah. I don't know. That's and I always loved point. that element of extra theater added on to the, sh the show that it seemed like they sort of pushed away from after Zoo TV. Um, I mean, Pop Mart was Unless kind of its own thing. The muscle uh, yeah. t-shirt. Or, or like the, the bull in Until the End of the World. Oh, yeah. 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 So they have little Very tastes fun. of it, but like fully costumed kind of, obviously with Morley, you know, yeah, sort like of well thought out. Yeah. I, I love that uh, element of the show anyways. And so, yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know, I Fabiano. Think we're all in agreement. That's the best song, right? Yeah, all three of us. Yes, I know. Fabiano said earlier in the chat too. That's his favorite song. He saw a ton of shows as well. So I don't know if you have a favorite performance, Fabiano. You can throw it in the chat room. Um, finally, just a small little light question. We'll quickly tackle from at you two Sherry. I'm not familiar with her work, but uh, do you think <laughs> the Joshua Tree tour has changed hearts and minds in regards to refugee issues? Or the art of compromise in the U.S. So, in two words or less, uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I I'll speak as the Canadian from the outside, I guess. I don't feel like I know that the band has that an intent for sure. I don't know that it seems like it's really moved the needle much in terms of actual uh, the rhetoric. The in the same way that back in the day, like say a Zoo TV tour calling up the president or whatever, um, they may have had more influence, but I'm on the outside looking south, I guess. So what do you folks think? Hmm. Um, I think that the most powerful place that they as a band have referenced what's gone on with the refugee crisis was what happened in Europe in the fall of 2015 when they went on to the European leg of I&E because I did see that show in Chicago as well. And then I was lucky enough to go to Dublin and see two there and watched most of the European shows on Periscope. And I mean, the difference with, uh, with the child that had washed up on the beach in, in, uh, in the Mediterranean 
happening right before, I think maybe the week of them opening back up in September of 2015 made that whole run just so powerful. And they were calling people out. I know that they're trying to continue to shine the spotlight on that, but I felt like it was probably more effective on IED. Yeah. Anything to add to I agree. Yeah. No, I agree with what, what Jeff said. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't think, I think right now, at least, um, and obviously it didn't feel it in Canada because it was the first show and we were all so focused on what were they going to do next. And, and I don't think that crowd was, I mean, if that crowd was angry, we would have, we wouldn't be here right now because we would have rioted in the GA line. <laughs> right. So that crowd was mellow to begin with, but we're so divided in America right now that, I mean, there was there was moments in a few of the cities that I was in, especially Cleveland, actually, probably the most conservative of the five cities I saw it in, at least, where I was looking around because not everybody was clapping when they should have been in, in my um, <laughs> right. in my heart. So I, I I don't think that unfortunately, I don't think that they're making as much of an impact as they'd like to or yeah. Ivana would like to. And just real quick on the compromise point, too. I mean, he's been saying, you know, everyone's welcome and from the left and the right. But I don't think they really hit on the perfect way to do that until they figured out how to do the JFK Reagan mashup of uh, the City on a Hill speech. The sad thing is that I don't think I don't think people are understanding that Reagan's in there <laughs> because in <laughs> Cleveland, for example, this is just one example. In Cleveland, I literally heard someone go, oh, JFK, of course, a Democrat. And it's like <laughs> two seconds later, you hear Ronald Reagan, if you're listening. Exactly. But Reagan's voice is sure. a little less distinctive, and it's a little quieter. Right. And they were already drunk and pissed by the time that they got to <laughs> Ronnie. So they, they tried. But I mean, the whole... Like a rose in a thorn bush, I guess. <laughs> the, uh, the video before exit is clearly left leaning. So if there's sure. any debate whatsoever of which side the band is on, it's explained before exit. Yeah. And that pisses <laughs> people off, I guess. Yeah. Especially cause you don't know. I know I've heard lots of people afterwards sort of thinking it was like edited by the band for like, you know, right. created or whatever to mock this idea or whatever, not realizing that it actually was a thing that was a, an actual show or whatever back in the day. It's a coincidence just, is what yeah. it is. It's a yeah. coincidence that somebody found yeah so um but yeah it's uh it's it's interesting i think that's where uh music in general doesn't feel like it has the same potency that it used to it not that it can't again but in in general just politically i know if you're a fan of a band it feels like like a u2 fan you feel like of course they're connecting of course they're you know they're passionate they're speaking to what i my heart yeah. or whatever but outside of the <laughs> the circle or the whatever it doesn't feel like that resonates and it doesn't have the same rippling effect out into the broader public that it used to anyways because there's just so many bands so many ways to consume music so many ways to listen or not listen so much other stuff to listen to like podcasts which are even more important <laughs> than <list> music but <laughs> no. um so it's just hard to have that same effect i think even comparing to zoo tv which are already at that point felt like music was yeah had changed a lot or whatever so well, and some of the people, like, I mean, uh, Sherry wrote a column about it recently. Some of the people that are actually surprised that U2 is getting political in concert. Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. like, wow, really? Like, yeah. okay, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, maybe you don't. Maybe you you haven't been to 30 shows, and I get that. Like, not everybody goes to see them every time they tour. But, I mean, just since I was six years old, I've known that they were political. Yeah. Whether I've agreed with them or not, or even understood them or not, you know, it's like I that that does surprise me when I hear stuff like that. And we did see somebody tweet <laughs> that they were upset Sunday Bloody Sunday was in the set because they didn't remember that being on the Joshua Tree. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, wow, you're in for it. Yeah. Enjoy the show. <laughs> Enjoy one. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's amazing they packed all 21 of those songs onto just one disc right i know <laughs> exactly. right that's a long album isn't it double album yeah. and then you go the other extreme i remember i was listening to a periscope and someone i could hear someone next to the person who was periscoping they're like i think they're gonna play the joshua tree from start to finish <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the idea but yeah. 
but yeah, I'd love to, it's, it's kind of, it would be fun. Obviously you can't follow at you too. You can't follow anything if you don't want to be spoiled at all like that. Um, but it would be fun going into some of these shows and not having any clue of what you're about to get. Kind of like we got a taste of that, like you said, in Vancouver, but, um, but yeah, beyond that, it's, it's hard to like become completely, um, yeah, immune, I guess, from hearing anything. So, um, anyways, that uh, uh, with apologies to Colin who couldn't couldn't be here for the rest of the <laughs> rest of the show. Uh, thanks, Jeff and Tasula, for joining me on the podcast for episode three of our Joshua Tree discussions. Uh, where can folks find you on the Twitters if they have a comment or follow up or want to hear Acrobat really bad? Jeff, we'll start with you. Oh wow, well, well, I can't promise acro- Acrobat, <laughs> but you can find me at U2GW. Nice and on Tassula. Twitter, on the Twitter, as you yeah. like to say. <laughs> Tasula, how about you? I'm at Tasula. Very easy to remember, not very easy to spell. <laughs> and I'm I Chris, and uh, you can follow at you too on the various platforms. Twitter is twittercom atu 2 facebookcom atu 2 com instagramcom atu 2 com uh, this episode can be found if you listen on the web or want to subscribe in Apple Podcasts and uh, there's such things like that at goodstuff.fm slash ATU2 and you can find all previous 62 episodes of the podcast if you're needing a U2 fix and want to go back to see here I guess all the previous ones we started videos around I don't know 10 episodes ago somewhere in there and uh, so most of them are audio only but uh, some of them have video versions as well embedded on the page so you can check that out and uh, like I said, using hashtag ask at you too on Twitter if you can want to send in comments or questions for the next episode. And if you visit uh, goodstuff.fm slash ATU2 slash 63, there'll be a link there where you can submit an audio submission for a future episode. Um, and uh, we'll have details on what some of the pod- to- podcast topics will be in the future. Um, but uh, such things as reviews of the European tour and possibly the Pink Adam lady.